And uh, today, the message is entitled, What Happens at the Feet of Jesus? And it's, it's amazing because the Bible lists many instances where people found themselves at Jesus' feet, and when they were there, some amazing things began to happen to them. So I want to share a couple of those things with us this morning in the next few moments that we have. Uh, before we get into that, though, why don't we pray one last time and ask God to bless us as we just open up the word today. Father, thank you so much for how you've uh, been working in the lives of Jonathan Francis and so many young people that have been involved in uh, the literature evangelism program. Lord, we're so excited for what you're going to do even this summer, and we continue to pray, Lord, that you would just bless the lives of so many more of the young people of our church, that we could really uh, continue to grow and develop and have a walk with you. But Lord, as we now transition to a time to uh, hear a message from you, hear a message from your word, we pray that your spirit would be in this place. We pray that you would speak to our hearts. We pray that you'd help all of us to have a deeper and stronger walk with you as we, by your grace, Lord, have a stronger desire to spend more time at your feet. Bless us as we open up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you go to the next slide here, uh, we have our first text this morning, which is from Matthew chapter 28 and verse 9. And the Bible says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and they held him by the feet. And the Bible says they did something. What did they do? They worshiped him. Now for context sake, this is right after the women were at the tomb and they saw the angels who told them that Jesus had now resurrected from the grave. And as they were super excited about that message that Jesus had been raised from the dead, they immediately got up and they were now on their way to tell the disciples that Jesus had risen. And as they were on this road, on the way, Jesus meets them in the middle of the road and the Bible says as soon as they see Jesus, they fall down at his feet and they worship him. The first thing that happens at the feet of Jesus is it's a time of worship. You know, when we spend time with God in the morning, when we have our devotional time at the feet of Jesus, did you know that that is a special time of worship? You know, I think many of us, at least for myself, before COVID especially, would think that worship was something that only happened in a building like this church. But God can have, uh, we can have worship to our God no matter where we are. And so every single day when, when we open up the Bible, when we spend time at Jesus' feet, it's a special time of worship. And maybe some of you can relate with my experience, but I always have felt oftentimes that my, my time with God in the morning was sort of a, a checklist of something that I knew I needed to do. You know, before I leave my house, I better read a, a text. Before I go to school or go to work, I, I better, uh, you know, spend a little bit of time in prayer. And it was sort of just a checklist of things to do. Or sometimes it was a, a time where I would try to read something that I could then post up on Facebook or Instagram or social media and be able to, you know, look good in front of my friends or family, you know, that I'm a spiritual person. And there's often times where we have different motives like that, whether it's a checklist, whether it's a time to look good. But our time with God is a time of deep worship to the creator that made us. So that's the first thing that happens at the, at the feet of Jesus. is It's a time of worship that we see in Matthew 28. If you go to the next slide here, I want you to notice, uh, let's go ahead and skip this verse here. I want you to notice uh, on the next slide um, in Luke chapter 10, where we see another instance of someone who fell at Jesus' feet. The Bible says, a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, but Martha was cumbered about with much serving. Now, how many of you, if I were to ask, how many of you would say you're a hospitable person? Like if someone comes over, you're very good with hospitality. Oh, okay. All right. All right. We have a few hands. Okay, good. Um, so you're a hospitable person. Now, let me ask you this. If you're, um, you know, very hospitable and you love to serve, is it bad to serve? Is it bad to uh, make sure that everything is perfectly ready for your guests. Is that a bad thing? 
No, that's not a bad thing. So Martha was doing a very good thing in making sure everything was nice and ready and prepared for when Jesus was going to enter the home. But if you go to the next slide, Jesus then says these words. He says, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things. Martha, you're, you're doing a lot of good things, but you're missing out on one thing. He says, one thing is needed or needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What was that thing that Mary did? And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And what did Mary do at the feet of Jesus? Heard his word. You see, Mary was someone that wanted to, when Jesus came into the house, she wasn't as concerned about making sure everything was perfect. She wanted to make sure that she could spend time at the feet of Jesus and not miss one word that came from his lips. You see, Martha was doing a good thing, but she was missing out on the most important thing. She could have easily said to herself, you know, Jesus, I'm over here getting something ready, and I'm, I'm, I can overhear what your conversation is with my brother and with Mary, but Mary didn't want to just overhear it. She wanted to carefully listen to every word that came from the lips of Christ. When we spend time with God, when we spend time at the feet of Jesus, do you hear Jesus speaking to you personally? Do you hear his voice speaking to you directly? When you open up the Bible, is it a time where you feel like it's ministering to you personally, where your friend Jesus in heaven is, is speaking to your heart? Do you have that kind of experience that Mary had in that moment? Or do you often feel like I've often felt many times where you open up the Bible and, you know, you, you read a passage and then as you finish, you just forget what you read and you close the book and you just kind of get about your day and continue and nothing really changes, nothing really impacts you. Why is it that we oftentimes have more of that experience than of the experience that Mary had? Well, if you go to the next slide here, this is from a book called Education, page 260, and it says these words. It says, many even in their seasons of devotion fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. So when you and I feel that way, when you and I open up the Bible and we read something and then we feel like Jesus didn't really speak to us and we just go about our day and nothing changes, this is not an uncommon thing. Many have that kind of experience of failing the, to receive the blessing of real communion with God but then the quote goes on to tell us why. It says, because they are in too great of what? Haste. Like Martha, so busy with other things, so busy with what's going on that we are in such a rush that we, we, we miss out on that blessing of communion with God. It says, with hurried steps, we press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps for a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for their counsel. And when, it, when that's our experience, when we're in a rush, when we're so busy with what we have going on in our lives that we miss that communion with God, what does it say in the next slide? It begins to happen to us. It says they have no time to remain with a divine teacher, and with their burdens, they return to their work. Why is it that many times we'll, we'll, we'll read a text, we'll spend some time with prayer, and then we just get up off our knees and we have our burdens still with us as we go to work, as we go to school, as we go about our lives? Maybe it's because we're in such a rush. We don't have time. We haven't made time to remain with the God that wants to speak to us personally. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I want to have that experience. I want to feel God speaking to me personally. I want to have a relationship with him that, you know, I'm excited. You know, let me just say this. I, I got married um, about four years ago uh, to my wife, Andrea, who's uh, here with us today. And, you know, I, I, four years ago, uh, when, I, when I married Andrea, I mean, it was just such a blessing. It was an amazing, amazing thing to be married. And I've really been enjoying these last couple of years. But let me ask you this. If I were to tell my wife that I was only going to talk to her 
and spend time with her maybe for about an hour on a Friday night and about an hour from 9 to 10 and another maybe hour from 11 to 12 on Saturday and I would never talk to her the rest of the week, let me ask you a question. How long will my marriage last? Someone said about a week. Yeah, probably that one week. And once that week's done, it's like, this is it. This is not working, right? See, God, Jesus wants to have that kind of of relationship with you that happens every single day. He wants to have a communion with you. He, he wants you to, to look forward. I look forward to talking to my wife, to spending time with my wife. I don't, I, don't, I don't dread it, and I don't say, oh, man, great, Friday night's coming. This is gonna be, you know, I have to spend time with my wife. Oh, man, this is gonna be a terrible day. No, I look forward to that time. And so Jesus wants us to be like Mary. God wants us to be like Mary, where we carefully listen to God speaking to us every day from his word. I, I want that experience. How about you? I know I want that experience. Number one, worship happens. It's a special time. Number two, it's a time to remain, to wait, to not rush, to let God speak to you personally. The third thing is in the next slide. In Matthew chapter 15, actually, let's skip this quote from Martin Luther. It's a good one, but I don't think we have time. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 30, it says, And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, those who were blind, those who were dumb, those who were maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And the Bible says something happened. What happened at the feet of Jesus in this instance? He healed them. The third thing that it happens at Jesus' feet is you and I can experience healing in our lives. Now, I love that it mentions those who were lame, in other words, those who could not walk, all of a sudden they, they started to feel the nerves in their feet coming back. Those who were blind and could not see, maybe many of them from birth, they opened their eyes and the very first face they saw was the face of Jesus. Those who could not speak and express themselves, who were dumb, the Bible says, they were now able to finally express how they feel. They were able to speak. And, and the Bible mentions how at the feet of Jesus, physical healing can happen, which is really an amazing thing. But it also mentions many others. Now, I don't know what those many others were. The Bible doesn't tell us who those others were. But I, I, I like to submit to you that I, I think Jesus doesn't only provide physical healing for us, but Jesus can also provide emotional healing for those of us who go through terrible situations in our lives, whether that's like a, d a devastating divorce in our life, whether that's some kind of, you know, traumatic experience that emotionally has hurt us and we have wounds from many years ago, Jesus can provide emotional healing for us in our lives. Not only can he provide emotional healing, but he can provide mental healing for those of us dealing with like depression and anxiety and struggles. You heard in the, in the story of Francis, many of us deal with those kinds of things and the feet of Jesus is a time where we can be healed mentally. It's also a time where we can be healed spiritually. For those of us who feel spiritually dead in our walks with God, going to the feet of Jesus, God can revive our spiritual lives and heal our spiritual wounds. And so whatever kind of healing you need today, I want to let you know if you spend time at the feet of Jesus, God can provide that healing for you. If you go to the next slide here, I got to share with you a story. So um, this program, Youth Rush, obviously happens here in our conference in Southeastern California Conference. But when I was at college at Souls West, um, we went to uh, different cities to go canvas. And I remember to do the same thing that we do in this program. And I remember when I heard that we were going to Las Vegas, I was like, are you sure this is the place that we should be going to do something like this? I mean, this place is called Sin City. And I don't know if anyone's going to be interested in, like, spiritual things. So is this really a good place to do this? But I remember on that first day, as we were all nervous, one of the teachers who was there with us, he said, hey, guys, I know that this is called Sin City, but I want to give this city a new name. So if you change the slide, he says, I want to call this Grace City. You know why? Because the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And God wants to give some grace to people in this city today. I remember I heard that, 
And I was so excited. I was like, all right, man, I'm not, I'm not in Sin City today. I'm in Grace City. I remember I knock on the door. This lady opens the door. She opens it up par- probably halfway through. I get through the introduction, and right away she's like, oh, yeah, I'm not really interested. She starts closing the door. And as she's closing the door, normally when that happens, I just move on to the next house and just continue on. But in that split second, I looked at her in her face, and I could tell that she was hurting. So I raised up my hand for just a second, and I said, wait, ma'am, before you close the door, I have something that can help you. She kind of opens the door a little bit more, and she's like, help me? You think you can help me? How in the world can you help me? You're just some kid who's like 18, 19 years old. How, you know, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand that I'm in the middle of a divorce right now. You don't understand that we're fighting over the custody of our kids. You don't understand that we're fighting over who's going to get this house and who's going to get this car. How in the world could you help me? And you know, it's in those moments when you don't really know what to say, that God just kind of gives you the right words to say in that, in that one instance, in that one moment. And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, you're right. I haven't gone through some of those things. I can only imagine how difficult it must be going through all those things. You're right. I personally can't help you. I said, but I know someone who can help you. And I know someone who's been through every single problem that you're going through right now, every trial that you ever have to face. And his name is Jesus. And I have a book right here. And I gave her a Steps to Christ. I said, this will, this, this will introduce you to this man that can help you in your situation right now. She looks at the book and, and tears start going down her face and she's like, how did you know that I need God in my life right now? This is exactly what I need. She was hugging the book and I remember as she thanked me, as I left that house that day, I remember just thinking to myself, you know, there are so many people in the world that need healing in their life, whether that's emotional, whether that's mental, wh- wh- whatever kind that they may need, that can be found in one place. And that's at the feet of Jesus. Number four, we're going to try to finish up here pretty soon. John chapter 11. John chapter 11, the fourth thing that happens, the Bible says, when Mary was come, where Jesus was, she saw him, she fell down at his feet, and she said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Uh, This is the instance of Lazarus, obviously, in John 11, being um, resurrected from the grave. And this is part of the story. Before Lazarus was resurrected, Mary goes to the feet of Jesus where she was used to going to. And she falls down at his feet, and she brings up the situation about her brother. Now, many people would say, what's the point of talking about your, your brother to Jesus? I mean, he's already died. He's gone, and, you know, there's nothing else that Jesus can do. It's been a few days already, and um, he's passed away. So, Mary, why are you even even coming to Jesus about this issue with your brother? We know the story that just a few verses later, Jesus resurrects her brother from the grave. And it reminded me that oftentimes at the feet of Jesus, when we spend time with God, you know, As we listen to his word, he speaks to us, we experience healing, we worship him, and as we talk back to him, it's it's really our time of prayer, but in our time of prayer, oftentimes like Mary, we bring to God situations in our lives that are oftentimes impossible. They're impossible situations because it, it feels like, you know, how can anyone make a comeback from a certain situation? So we pray for someone in our lives, whether that's a uh, 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 maybe a, a child of ours that has, you know, left the church or whether that's a, a spouse or a family member or a close friend that's going through a difficult situation. And, you know, many times we come to God just like Mary with these impossible situations and it really doesn't seem like God is able to do anything. It doesn't seem like he's really working. But I have a story I want to share with you. If you go to the next slide here, there were a, a couple of parents, a set of parents that were praying for their son. Their son uh, was now on in the LA Times. He was now on the KCAL 9 News one night when they turned on the TV. And their son was on his way to prison for being a part of a, gr- a set of bank robberies with different uh, people in his group. And, and, uh, and as they saw this son, 
their heart was broken because this was a son that they had raised at the Campus Hill Church in Loma Linda. This was a son that had went to Loma Linda Academy that had been baptized as an Adventist as a young kid. And since he was about 15 or 16 years old, he started getting involved in stuff that he shouldn't get involved in. And he just kind of, kind of left um, the faith that he had been raised with. And now here he was um, in his 30s on his way to prison. Now, the parents prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And about 20 years of prayer for their son, one day there was a, um, there was a, a different a, a change that happened in their son's life. Their son sent out an email to um, his younger brother, um, and he said, hey, um, would you be able to send me some books about God, about the Bible? I'm kind of interested in, in getting to know God. And little did he know that his little brother um, was a literature evangelist. And so he had plenty of books that he could send to him. And as he began to send these books to his brother, um, his brother began to, to, to read them, and, and he began to do the Bible study guides, and soon enough, he made a decision while he was there in prison that he said, when I get out, I want to make sure to give my whole life back to God. I want to get baptized when I get out of prison, and in case you didn't catch it already, um, I'm the little brother, and that's my brother, and those were my parents, and so after 23 years of my parents praying for my older brother, they finally began to see a change happening in his life. And after my brother got out in 2019, a few months after he got out of prison, I had the privilege of being able to take this picture in the next slide of my brother as he got baptized, giving his life over to God. What an amazing, amazing thing to witness. What an amazing answer to prayer for parents who were praying for their son. I don't like to spend too much on this point because I start to get a little bit emotional as I talk about it, but I just want to say one thing to the parents. I'm not a parent yet, so I can only imagine, but if you are a parent of a son who has left the Lord, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't give up on your children. God can do it even after 23 years. He could do that for your family as well. I got to say this line. You know, my brother was 16 years older than me. He's 16 years older than me, and he held me as a little baby. So I like to say that he held me when I was born, but I got a chance to give him a big hug after he got baptized. So I got to hold him. When he was born again, it was really just a beautiful, beautiful experience that can happen at the feet of Jesus. So no matter what experience you may be going through in your personal family, in your life, go to the feet of Jesus. Amazing things can happen there. I'm going to go ahead and skip this last verse here because I think I'm pretty much out of time. But I just want to conclude, um, if you just go to the next slide, I think... Yeah, that's fine. Um, I just want to conclude by saying these words. You know, many of us oftentimes in our experience with God, we, you know, we, we, we don't have that kind of thriving devotional life with God, that communion with God. But I hope today, this personal time in your walk with God, but I hope if anything, this message would motivate or encourage you to dedicate more time to getting to know the God that, that wants a deep relationship with you. And if you're specifically a, a young person, um, a, a young adult, um, a youth, um, you know, when we share about this program, Youth Rush, it's, it's not just something that we share to, you know, I guess because it's like our job to share it. This is something I've been doing for, for 12 years, and this is something that has changed my life and changed so many lives of people that have been involved in this. And so if you maybe want to have a different experience and want to go deeper in your walk with God, consider doing something like this that can be life-changing. You know, building that relationship with God is the most important thing that you can do in your life. And so whether you're young 
um, you're old or somewhere in the middle, God wants to give you an amazing, amazing experience in your walk with him. How many of you want to go deeper in your walk with God? How many of you want to say, God, I want to be at your feet and experience amazing things in my life? That's my prayer, and I pray that that's yours as well. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for giving us this amazing opportunity this morning to learn about the powerful things that can happen when we dedicate our lives, our time, in our schedule, in the busyness of our lives to, to be like Mary and to spend time at your feet. Father, I pray that you would motivate us, that you would help this to become the most important thing in our lives, that nothing else would take the place of being with you. Thank you, God, that you've changed the life of my brother. Thank you so much that you've changed my life. Thank you that you've changed the lives of, of many of us, Lord. You've, we're here for a reason because you've impacted our lives. But Lord, help us to continue to keep our walk with you consistently where every day we can hear you speak to us. Every day we can experience transforming healing and, and answers to our prayers and worship you. I pray, God, that you would help us to have this amazing experience. And Lord, I just lastly want to pray for the young uh, people in this church, the youth, the young adults. Lord, I, I want to pray for them. If they need a deeper experience with you, if you're calling them to do something different, this summer, that you would please lead them and guide them and impress them in what you would have them to do, Lord. This is my prayer, and we pray that you would bless us the rest of the Sabbath, that we would go with you, that your spirit would be not only in this place, but in our hearts as we leave, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.